Silvergate Bank, Deep Dive, Part 3, Valuation. Let's join the conference call uh, on January 17th, where they announced the preliminary fiscal year 2022 figures. FY 2022 financials, unaudited and preliminary in nature, just released, along with color commentary in the footnotes beneath each spreadsheet. Highlights uh, from those spreadsheet numbers include a tangible value per share of 12.93 and a net loss attributable to, attributable to common shares of 1 billion, or $33.16 per diluted share. On page three of the transcript, CFO Tony Moreno in his first remarks on the call states, tier one leverage ratio was 5.36% based on average assets of 15 billion and continues to exceed the well capitalized standards as defined by federal banking regulations. Understanding this sentence was the most important undertaking in all my due diligence respective to Silvergate thus far. It explains everything that happens since and much of what I found confusing in terms of their accounting behavior beforehand. Let's see what Wikipedia says about capital ratios. Capital requirement, also known as regulatory capital, capital adequacy, or capital base, is the amount of capital a bank or other financial institution has to have as required by its financial regulator. This is usually expressed as a capital adequacy ratio of equity as a percentage of risk-weighted assets. These requirements are put into place to ensure that these institutions do not take on excess leverage and risk becoming insolvent. Capital requirements govern the ratio of equity to debt recorded on the liabilities and equity side of a firm's balance sheet. They should not be confused with reserve requirements, which govern the asset side of a bank's balance sheet. In particular, the proportion of its assets it must hold in cash or highly liquid assets. Capital is a source of funds, not a use of funds. So then, the capital requirement is liquid assets to total assets. And then the capital ratio. Capital ratio is a percentage of a bank's capital to its risk-weighted assets. Weights are defined by risk sensitivity ratios whose calculation is dictated under the relevant accord. Basel II requires that the total capital ratio must not be lower than uh, 8%. These are regulatory rules, and not, if not in compliance, a bank can be banned from conducting banking activities in the United States. Tier 1 capital requirements are calculated by, quote, Tier 1, the more important of the two, consists largely of shareholders' equity and disclosed reserves. This is the amount paid up to original to originally purchase the stock or shares of the bank, not the amount those shares are currently trading for on the stock exchange. Retain profits, subtracting accumulated losses, and other qualifiable Tier 1 capital securities. Retained profit minus accumulated losses. So Silvergate was required to make sure the bank retained, quote, must have a Tier 1 capital ratio of at least 4%, a combined Tier 1 and Tier 2 capital ratio of at least 8%, and a leverage ratio of at least 4%. 4% versus qualifying assets after deducting a billion dollars from their Tier 1 capital. Ouch. <laughs> what can a bank do in such a situation? Only two things. Increase Tier 1 capital or decrease the qualifying assets on which the ratio is based. Selling securities makes it worse. Even though an asset is removed, the before maturity price it must be sold for creates a debit against the booked end value of the asset calculated at maturity or amortized to that point versus its maturity value. So the maturity value is deducted from the assets while the lower sales price is deducted from liabilities, leaving a net loss attributable to common, which comes right off the shareholder equity and, most damaging to Silvergate, right off Tier 1 capital requirements. Or rather... Tier, tier 1 capital that they, they hold against the requirements. The only arrow left in a bank's quiver to meet Tier 1 leverage ratios is to reduce the qualifying assets. So Silvergate had no choice but to take real, valuable assets off its books somehow to lessen the Tier 1 regulatory net capital needed to meet the uh, ratios. How did they do this? By writing off intangible, by writing off deferred tax assets, DTAs, by taking asset impairments in advance for the next quarter. tax asset balance associated with net operating losses will carry forward indefinitely and can be utilized against 80% of future taxable income, as we could provide at this point. ...of this 100% valuation allowance on the DTA. Yeah, thanks, Alan. Yeah, so, so Dave, as far as that valuation allowance goes, 
Um, so in in the near term, um, I mean it's it's a, it's a you know as as I said earlier, it's, it's it, we've got a deferred tax allowance um, or deferred tax asset balance of three hundred forty two million dollars, uh, driven by by both you know the losses that we've incurred um, in the fourth quarter and and you know some of the um, the the accrued losses um, that we anticipate. Um, in 2023. So from a from a tax perspective, with some of those accrued losses that will be realized in 2023, the the allowance is 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 one of those things that's done on a on a year by year basis. So from a tax perspective, as we've disclosed, so there's there's future value there in the same quarter of last year. The increase sequentially and year over year primarily resulted from a 196.2 million dollar impairment charge on developed technology assets we acquired in early 2023 to reduce wholesale borrowings, which resulted in the recognition of impairment charge of $134.5 million in the fourth quarter related to the unrealized loss on those securities expected. The only arrow left in a bank's quiver to meet Tier 1 leverage ratios is to reduce the qualifying assets. So Silvergate had no choice but to take real, valuable assets off its books somehow to lessen the Tier 1 regulatory net capital needed to meet the uh, ratios. Uh, to, to, to reduce wholesale funding, that, that implies a further reduction. So, um, you know, that, that's kind of step one on average assets. You know that the the tier one leverage ratio that we disclosed 5.36 it's based on average assets um, of approximately 15 billion um, as I mentioned in my prepared remarks, um, but the balance sheet ended at 11.3 billion. So on a pro forma basis, with the tier one capital that we had at year end, that that would imply an entry point above seven percent. Um, and then with the further guidance of or, or subsequent event disclosure that we. Sold down a, a billion five in, in securities uh, to 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 reduce wholesale funding. That that implies a further reduction. So path of of rebuilding the tier one leverage ratio. How did they do this? By writing off intangible by writing off deferred tax assets, DTAs, by taking asset impairments in advance for the next quarter. Toward this end, they specifically took a $196 million impairment on intangibles for Diem, a $200 million asset purchased from Meta's Facebook less than a year ago, leaving zero intangible assets on their balance sheet. They took a $342 million valuation allowance against deferred tax assets, or DTAs, as a result of losses as carry forwards. They took a $134.5 million impairment charge against anticipated security sales coming up in the next quarter. All of this to get their assets down so that the, per, the, rate, the percent that they needed of net capital would be there to meet the Tier 1 requirements so they can stay in business as a bank. This was more important than anything else. You know, it didn't matter what it shows us shareholder equity at the end of the quarter. They hope the shareholders understand they need to stay as, in business as a bank. So if they make their equity disappear magically by turning them into ghost assets, that's what they have to do. Yes, it's accounting trick, Uri, and they don't announce it clearly. That's what they're doing in, in their uh, 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 conference call in the annual report, but they clearly allude to it. 